Hello there, heroes, and I'm the Orange Ranger with special co-host Sassy the Cat, and welcome to another comically long review. Beyond the Grid ended characteristically terribly, so we need a nice palette cleanser. And that and the other Power Rangers comics. Okay, she's not gonna co-host. <laughs> Hello there, heroes. I'm the Orange Ranger, and welcome to another comically long review. Beyond the Grid ended characteristically terribly, so we need a nice palate cleanser. And that other Power Rangers comic series is here to provide in spades. It has really blown my mind just how down I was on GoGo -Go Power Rangers when the series started. How much I said that I didn't need this young adult look at the Rangers regular lives. And how much now my opinion on the two series has completely flipped around. Now it's GoGo -Go Power Rangers that's providing the absolutely amazing Power Rangers comic content while the main series was limping its way through Beyond the Grid. As I mentioned previously, both of these series were building up to major conclusions that would change their status quo. We've seen Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. Let's get started on GoGo's by taking a look at GoGo -Go Power Rangers issues 19 and 20. The main cover for issue 19 is somewhat ominous, showing Zordon looking down on 1Z, aka Alpha 1, alone. It's a normal picture on the surface, but there's just a dark quality to everything. The Ranger variant is actually the exact opposite of a Ranger, as Rita Repulsa reaches towards the reader. The movie homage is another classic as Rita, Scorpina, and Goldar put a spell on you in the poster for Hocus Pocus. And the retro sewed cover is Foul Play in the Sky when Kimberly had to land her Uncle Steve's plane with Bulk and Skull in the back. Over 10,000 non-chronologically consistent comic starts ago, Lady Fienna is fleeing with Rita, now a young child. Rita is tired, so Fienna has her rest behind a tree, telling her to close her eyes and keep them closed no matter what she hears. We see her pursuers, Tenga Warriors, crow-like grunts from Season 3 of Mighty Morphin, and if you change the A to a U, they also come from the Mighty Morphin movie. She tells them to back off. Being bird brains, they of course don't listen, and though she drives a lot of them off, their numbers are too great. Back to the present, the ghost of Lady Fienna tells Rita that she doesn't blame her for any of this, knowing Master Evil manipulated her into being evil. She grabs Rita with a rock golem hand, but Rita easily breaks free. With this creepy face, Rita declares herself the most feared woman in the galaxy. Her mother asks if she should be proud of that, and Rita says better to be feared than forgotten. Lady Fienna won't give up on her daughter. However, Rita demonstrates both her power and creepiness, turning into a series of shadow ghosts around the room. Rita says Fienna stole her by giving birth to her? and hid her away, but Master Vile saved her and showed her all the dark little secrets of the universe. He made me strong. He made me powerful. My father turned me into a survivor. I'm a survivor. I'm gonna make it. Unlike you. Dang. Rita reappears, and now knowing how strong her mother is, she can chain her up all nice and safe. Fienna pleads with her daughter, starting to say she just wants to help her, but Rita stopped caring about what Fienna wants a long time ago. Jason and Trini are training in the morning at the juice bar, and Trini brings up the conversation the group had about Onesie. Jason presumes that she means to apologize, but of course, that's not what she means. She hits him with her trademark sweep and asks for an explanation. Jason says it would be nice if Trini backed him as the leader. 
She says he means that she's just supposed to agree with him no matter what. He denies that, and she tells him that no matter what they are, she's not going to just sit quietly and agree with him. As putties attack the city, Billy flies in, and I was stuck in what reference to make here between Triceratops Iron Man, an early version of the Dino Charge Battleizer, or the latest knockoff toy. Anyway, it's an enhanced ranger suit, sporting a gold circle for the dumb coin symbol on the chest thing, but anyway, it has enhanced strength, armor plating, and features of his Zord, like horn chains. It can also fly, but something goes wrong with a jet booster and he crashes into a car. Uh, I, I flied? No, you falled. The putties come charging in as the suit breaks down from the damage, but they then dissolve into light. Yes, this was all a simulation. Zack and Onesie are still impressed, Onesie even saying he may need to steal an idea or two. Billy asks Zordon what he thinks, and while he's also impressed, he says it needs a bit more testing before it ever sees the battlefield. Zack needles him a little, saying it could really help keep them safe, but Zordon is always thinking of their safety, hence being cautious. Kimberly goes running off to school in the morning, but her mother stops her. She's been busy in the kitchen, making a pastry feast for breakfast. I love this part. You can make cinnamon rolls? Of course, there are videos online. Kim wonders if Rita has paid a visit, but her mom just says that with so much going on, maybe the two of them could just sit and talk. Kim realizes what's going on here and says her parents need to stop doing this. Her mother realizes that she's seen her father without her knowledge and panics, asking what he said about her and that he lies. Kimberly screams for her to stop it, saying she's not going to choose between the two of them and telling her mother to grow up. Counselor time! Who knew that Miss Pruitt would become such a vital character? Jason has stopped in, thinking she's kind of like a therapist. Not exactly, but she is willing to talk, and Jason, of course, wants to talk about Trini. Jason describes how the two got into a fight, and she was mad at him before he even realized what was happening. I have to sort of disagree with the counselor's advice here. She presumes that Trini thinks Jason did something wrong. He asks if he did, and the counselor says, that doesn't matter. You have to be open and honest and willing to try and fix it. The Bard comes to mind, old Willie Shakespeare himself. Polonius says in Hamlet, this above all, to thine own self be true. Trust me, I am far from an expert on relationships, but while I think it's important to try and drop your pride and examine if you have made a mistake, I've never really liked the apologize anyway line of thinking. Honesty above all. If you haven't done anything wrong, Acknowledge that your partner is upset and work towards an understanding. Just apologizing for no reason is not going to fix the baseline issue. But you don't have to take my word for it. In the downstairs lab that was Billy's office and is now Onesie's lab, the two are working on fixing the Triceratops armor, Onesie pointing out a combustor issue. Zack, however, is still sour about Zordon babying them. Billy doesn't see it that way and asks Onesie to back him up. Onesie sort of plays it in the middle. Zordon has fought this war for a long time and has lost a lot, and he would do anything to protect them, even from themselves. This starts to bring Billy around to Zack's way of thinking as he starts to say that he's only trying to help win the war, I guess, but Zack keeps digging in. No matter what they do, Zordon will always see them as children. Onesie chimes in and we see the first whiffs of a psychological, philosophical difference from Zordon. He says the rangers are far more than just children, and while Zordon's rules for them may come from affection, they may also be keeping this war against evil at a stalemate. Jason finds Trini studying in the juice bar and tries to apologize, only able to manage saying that he's dumb. She stares at him 
and the affection breaks through as she forgives him. He asks never to do that again, and she says instead they can do something that doesn't require talking. For the second time, Kimberly has excellent timing, walking up and wondering what exactly not talking means. They awkwardly play it off and Jason leaves. Kim asks what's going on, but Trini isn't talking. Kim herself points out that this is the second time this has happened and puts the pieces together. Trini desperately tries to change the subject to onesie, but Kim's not having it. She gets saved by the bell, or rather by the... Earth-shattering kaboom! Goldar, Squat, and Babu enter the juice bar with a squad of putties, ending the issue. Ranger Wiki made a good point that I'm going to share with you heroes here. This issue has a very interesting parallel between Kimberly and Rita. Both had parents who had, shall we say, a nasty divorce, and the younger ones had to make a choice. Granted that Rita was a lot younger. Rita chose her father, and we see the road that led her down. Kimberly is more independent, realizing that both of her parents have flaws and may not be who she thought they were. That ties into the other main story of this issue, Billy's power armor and Zordon's caution with the Rangers. Zordon is also a sort of parent to the Rangers, and as the teens begin to grow up and express their independence, they question his caution with them and start to see his desire for their safety as a lack of trust in them. As is often the case in reality, there is an influence there encouraging them as Onesie encourages this independence. Jason and Trini's relationship and fight is sort of the D plot here. And like I said, I really didn't agree with the counselor's advice that sometimes you have to apologize anyway, even if you don't mean it or understand it, in order to maintain a relationship. But overall, this was a strong, well-written issue, as has been usual for GoGo Power Rangers. Issue 19 gets a 4 out of 5. Issue 20 has the standard for covers. The main cover is awesome. A group shot of the Rangers with them unmorphed above left and a face shot of the Megazord above right. And the movie homage is the Iron Giant with the Megazord standing in for the titular character. You know, I've realized I can't say the word titular without picturing some kind of breast themed enemy of Godzilla. The other two covers, however, strongly hint at what this arc is leading to. The Retrosode cover is Green with Evil, Part 1. And the Ranger variant, that's right, it's the Green Ranger playing his Dragon Dagger. At least five years before an issue of Gogo -Go would ever start with the present day, Zack's dad has brought him to the opening of the Angel Grove Juice Bar. He pitches the martial arts, gymnastics, even the video games, but Zack is only interested in hanging out with his cousin Curtis. Zack's dad makes him a deal. They'll go in for 10 minutes, look around, and if Zack hates it, they'll leave. I love this next sequence because it demonstrates the comics filling in gaps that the show never did. Why did Ernie open the juice bar and youth center in the first place? We see him at the grand opening, his younger age demonstrated by a trident goatee and double earrings, as he tells a story from his youth. His uncle owned a gym he'd hang out at every day, and he always saw another kid that was there basically open to close. Ernie thought the kid was just obsessed with working out, but he eventually learned that the kid pretty much hid from his family there, it being the only place that he felt safe. That story does not have a happy ending, as his uncle was forced to close the gym and Ernie never saw the kid again. But he always remembered him, and something about the story seems to resonate with Zack. Ernie swore one day he'd build a similar place, but better. A place where all kids could come and just be safe and have fun. Zack decides the place isn't so bad, and a familiar kid, dressed in red asks Zack to hold the punching bag. Present day, that punching bag has been taped up once or 50 times. 
Oh yeah, and the place is crawling with putties and monsters. Goldar has come to claim one of the rangers to be sacrificed for the dragon power coin. Bulk makes a brave run to go get help, but Goldar grabs him. He doesn't want to hurt them, just draw out the rangers hiding among them. Kim wants to go help Bulk, but Trini says there are too many people around for them to morph. They need to stay low and wait for the others. Rita watches, telling her stupid little minions to bring her one of the rangers. Fienna, still chained up and forced to watch this, says Rita is fooling no one. She loves her little minions. She denies it, but Fienna points out they fail time and again, yet she keeps them around. Rita turns this around on her, asking Fienna if Master Vile loved her. She says she has to believe he did. Rita asks if that's because she'd have been fooled otherwise, but she says no. It's because Rita is the product of their love. Fienna says Vile wasn't always, well, vile. He was forgiving and kind and even gentle. Rita finds that hard to believe, but Fienna says he was then basically infected with evil. She knows Vile is lost to her, but if Rita can still love her minions, there is hope for her. Bit of a stumble here on the next page. Billy, Zack, and Onesie come running into the command center saying they just got Zordon's signal because they were all in the lab. Um, all indications are that that lab is basically downstairs. Why wouldn't they have gotten the signal right away? Anyway, Zordon informs them of the attack on the juice bar. Billy points out that this attack isn't Rita's usual style, and Zack says maybe they can return the favor when it's over. The two of them morph, and Onesie starts to plan out what he'll do, but Zordon says no. Zordon doesn't want Onesie to head into the battle, concerned with escalating the situation. But this time, Zack puts his foot down, saying that Onesie is coming along. Zordon worries about what Rita's plan might be, but this is too personal for Zack to leave any helpful resources behind. Now, we can either sit here and argue while people get killed, or you can let us go. Your call. With lives on the line, Zordon acquiesces. Goldar, still holding Bulk in the air, starts threatening to remove some of his limbs until the rangers show up. Kim won't let anything happen to Bulk, starting to morph, but then Jason shows up as the Red Ranger. Now put him down before I take away that sword and beat you with it. However, as much as Goldar wants a fight, that's not the plan. He demands Jason surrender or he kills everyone in the room, starting with Bulk. Jason agrees, demanding the people be released first, but giving his word he'll go along. Goldar lets the people go, but then we get a little People of New York Spider-Man moment. You mess with me, you mess with New York! You mess with one of us, you mess with all of us! As they don't plan on letting the Red Ranger go anywhere without a fight. With everyone focused on throwing things at Goldar, Kim and Trini slip away to morph. Goldar calls off the mercy and plans to slaughter everyone, but the crowd bought just enough time for Zack, Billy, and Onesie to arrive. Putties, a waste of such a remarkable substance. Hmm. Jason claims Goldar for himself and tells the others to clear out the others. I knew you guys were sniveling sycophants, but I thought we at least had an understanding. Um, listen, I'm not saying that being ditzy is a key part of Kimberly's character. She is intelligent and talented, defying the expectations of your standard valley girl. However, I think it's important to remember a character's voice. Kim might know what sniveling sycophants means, but it's not something that she would say. That is a Billy line. Anyway, that understanding is basically the answer to the question, why doesn't Rita attack the command center? Why don't the Rangers attack the moon base? We don't mess with your house. You don't mess with our house. Kimberly summons her bow, basically asking if it's clear that the juice bar is off limits. Squat and Babu get the message, fleeing. 
Kim tells the hostages to run now, but then Matt approaches her. He addresses her as Pink Ranger, thanking her for the save, and the two of them stare at each other for a moment as the battle rages around them. Then he says he'll get everyone out and wishes her good luck. The Rangers find Goldar and Jason still fighting and trash-talking each other one-on-one. -on -one. We see the Rangers, well, honor, basically. The other Rangers stand aside, recognizing this as a contest of champions, a one-on-one -on -one battle of equals. Then Onesie shoots Goldar in the back. You'd shoot a man in the back. Well, it's the safest way, isn't it? Welcome to the turning point, heroes. Onesie says he cannot allow any of this to continue. He's using a scrambler to keep Goldar from teleporting away. If you allow him to escape today, he will simply return to prey upon you again tomorrow. It is time to send a message both to Rita and Zordon that this charade of a war ends today. Execute him! The Rangers, of course, are not on board with this, but Onesie says Zack said it himself. If you want to end the cycle, change the rules. I'm not exactly sure when Zack did say that, but anyway, he calls this the logical response. The behavior is highly illogical. Onesie sees they're not going to do it and decides to take this step himself. Zack tries to talk him out of it, but Onesie just tosses him aside. He moves to execute Goldar, but gets shot in the face by Trini. I never did like you. How's this for a twist, heroes? The Rangers jump into battle against Alpha to save Goldar. We see that both have sort of had this battle in the back of their mind for a while, Jason already having a plan to take Onesie down, and Onesie revealing that he's been holding back since he knew that this might happen. He tells the Rangers they're lucky he's programmed not to kill them, instead encasing them in a force field. His fight isn't with them, but with Zordon, who he contacts. He tells Zordon he's doing everything that Zordon won't. Zordon says betraying the Rangers isn't the answer, but Alpha One does not want to hear anything about betrayal. He rebuilt himself, traveling the galaxy and fighting in Zordon's name, and learned that Zordon's methods have changed. Secrecy, not escalating fights, and the battle had slowed, allowing innocents to suffer. Onesie tells Zordon he could end this war at any time. He just doesn't want that blood on his hands. And Zordon agrees. He said he could do that, setting aside mercy and compassion, and would even gladly do that to save the universe. But there are heroes out there fighting the right way, ones who have died defending those ideals. How could Zordon tell those people that they died for nothing? Onesie asks if that's what he was, a sacrifice for the right way of fighting, sent in unprepared to die. Onesie doesn't allow Zordon to answer that, saying he's not going to let him dictate the terms of this war anymore. He had tried to make the Rangers see Zordon's failings, but feels they are too brainwashed to listen. He plans, after killing Zordon, to unburden them of the responsibility of being rangers, finding warriors more suitable than children. You may remember that just a few pages ago, Onesie told Zack and Billy that he saw them as far more than just children. He's been lying to them the whole time. He blows apart a car nearby, the parts flying all around him, as he says he will accomplish the goal he was programmed with, Zordon's dream of peace and prosperity, even if that means eliminating him in the process, as from the cars around him, he forms a Megazord body. Whenever you have a character that does a heel turn like Alpha One in this issue, there's a risk of it being too sudden, of there being no sign of it. It's intended to be shocking. This new ally that made us stronger never actually was on our side. 
That is far from the case here. I tried to kind of subtly point out some of the examples of things that hinted towards Onesie's turn, telling the rangers that they weren't just kids and that they could be doing more than Zordon lets them do, remarking on what an amazing substance the putties are made out of, shooting Goldar in the back, etc., etc. Alpha One conducted a wonderful secret little campaign to try and turn the rangers against Zordon, even if it wasn't successful. And here again, just like in issue 19, we have another parallel. In this case, it's Rita and Fienna and Zordon and Onesie. Fienna and Onesie both try to convince what's really the two primary forces of this series to change from the archetypes that they represent, but neither of them can truly turn away from what they are. We have the fight in the juice bar that moves outside and then transitions to the fight against Onesie, which provides a lot more action in this issue than I'm used to with the more talkative Gogo, but it was all balanced very well, and overall this was another fantastic issue. Issue 20 gets a 4.5 out of 5. So, in keeping with my new video release schedule, the next comically long review will be coming out in two weeks. And while I thought I was going to keep with my jumping back and forth between series, talking about Mighty Morphin Power Rangers issues 40 and 41, that doesn't feel right. Those issues are a new beginning, but we still have an ending to get to here. Next time on a comically long review, Go Go Power Rangers, Forever Rangers. That is going to do it for another comically long review. Heroes, thank you so much as always for watching. In the comments below, let me know what you thought of these issues. The primary thing I'll ask you about this time is what did you think of Onesie's heel turn? Was that handled well? I mean, could you see it coming from a mile away? Or do you think that it was a nice balance of the suspense and that and everything? Let me know down in the comments below. While you're down there, make sure you smack that thumbs up button and let me know that you enjoyed this video. Make sure you're subscribed to my channel to see all of my videos and ring that bell. Get your notifications set up so you are notified by email or text message or communicator beep or whatever that I've posted brand new videos like these comically long reviews. And if you would like to lend any financial support to my channel, head over to ko-fi.com slash orange ranger videos. There you can buy me a coffee. Those are set at $3. I greatly appreciate any of those that I find there. Until next time, heroes, may the power protect you. Fienna played, played, as putties attack the silly, wow. The putties come charging in as the suit breaks down from the damage, but fuck, you have to be open and honest to willing and blah, 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 blah. Onesie points out a combustor issue. That doesn't read right. That was a comma instead of a period. Issue 19 gets a 4.5 out of 5. And the movie homage is the Iron Giant with the Meg... Now, we can either... In this case, it's Rita and Fienna and Onesie and Zordon. I didn't say that right. This time, it's Rita and Fienna and Zordon and Onesie. Rita...